Romans chapter 1 there, beginning in verse 1, the Bible reads, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. And what I want to preach uh, this morning is about the decorate the declaration of the resurrection. As you see there, it says there in, in verse uh, in verse two that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So, what does it mean to declare something? It's saying that he was declared to be the Son of God. Well, to declare something is simply just to say something. It's to say something in a, in, in a solemn or very emphatic manner. To say something with uh, great authority. Now, some of the synonyms that would give us an understanding of what it means to declare something would be to, it would mean to, it would be to say, I proclaim something. We could say that Jesus Christ was proclaimed to be the Son of God. It would be to announce something. We could say that with Jesus Christ was announced to be the Son of God or that he was, uh, it was stated that He was the, the Son of God. Another way... To declare something is to reveal something. We could say that Jesus Christ was revealed to be the Son of God by the power of the resurrection. It also means to declare something is to publicize or to broadcast something. And isn't that what we do when we go out and we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're publicizing, we're broadcasting that Jesus Christ is the Son of God by the power of the resurrection. That is the declaration that we publicize, that we broadcast, is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, men have made many uh, declarations. We could probably think of, of at least one, the Declaration of, of Independence. Probably everybody's at least heard of that in the room, that the Declaration of Independence, when our forefathers of this country declared their uh, independence from Great Britain, that they said that they were going to be their own independent country, and they declared their independence. Now, that's a very powerful document in terms of uh, as men would esteem it. Men would esteem that as a very powerful document. But God has made an even more powerful declaration in His Word than that is that the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the declaration that God has publicized, that God has revealed, that God has shown to us through His Word. The declaration of the resurrection. And I want to look at that de declaration this morning. What is that declaration? What is it that God has declared or revealed? And how has He done it by the, through the resurrection? You see, the resurrection proclaims something this morning. It, it declares something. It announces something to the world. It reveals something to the world this morning. Now, the thing that it declares is quite simply that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. As we just read there in verse 4, "...and declared to be the Son of God with power." according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So what is it that God has declared? Is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the declaration that God has made to the world this morning, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now this isn't just the first mention of it here in Scripture. This declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is a declaration that God has been proclaiming throughout His entire Word, and it's something that will be declared in the future, and for all of eternity, we'll see that, that Jesus Christ is declared to be the Son of God. If you would there, turn over to uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And we'll look at some of the Old Testament allusions to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By, if you're turning to Daniel, chapter 3, I'll read to you from Proverbs, chapter 30. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, as you're turning to Daniel 3, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the winds in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So obviously here, the, the, he's, he's, he's uh, alluding to the fact that it's God who can ascend up into heaven, who can descend, who can gather the winds in his fist, who can bind the, bind the white waters as a garment, who can establish all the ends of the earth. Only God could do that. And then it goes on and says, what is his name and what is his son's name? So we see in the Old Testament allusion to the fact that God has a son. We can see here that, that God in the book of Proverbs even is declaring that there is a son. That there is that, that there is, uh, there's not just the father, but that there is the son also. If you're in Daniel 3, chapter 24, we'll see an even more clear allusion to the fact that there is one known as the son of God. 
The Bible says in Daniel 3, verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonied, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of fire? So if you remember the story, it was the three uh, Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made, and were therefore cast into the fire. And now we see King Nebuchadnezzar is astonished, he's astonied, he's standing up and he's looking in the fire, and he's saying, did we not cast three men and bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men. He says, We tossed in three, but now I see four. That's why he's astonished. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So you see there at the end, he says he is that fourth man, the form of him was like unto the Son of God. Again, another Old Testament allusion to the fact that God has a Son. This is the declaration that we find even in the Old Testament, that there is a Son of God. And it is made clear, it is declared and revealed to us that that Son of God is Jesus Christ in the New Testament. There are, all, of course, other passages that we could turn to in the Old Testament that would show us that God is three, that there are more than, that God is, 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 as it says in 1 John 5, that there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that, that God is three in one. We could turn to Genesis 1, we, we won't for sake of time, where God said in God, in the very beginning of the, of, of, the, of the Bible, in the first chapter of it, where it says, let us make man in our own image. God speaking to, to himself in, in, a, in a plurality there. Again, in, in Genesis chapter 11, where they came down to see the tower of Babel that men had built, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They all have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be strained from them which they have imagined to. Go to, let us go down. Again, these are Old Testament's allusions to the fact, showing us that God is not just God the Father, but there is also God the Son. That is the declaration that we find in the New Testament. Now there are some very clear New Testament statements. Obviously, the New Testament is a clarification of the things that we find in the Old Testament. Many of the things that are, are harder to understand in the Old Testament are easily understood when we look at it through the lens of the New Testament. It helps, it sheds light on the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says in verse 41, Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will save him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So the Jews here are saying, hey, let him come down from the cross. Because he said that he was the Son of God. And it's interesting that, that this declaration that Jesus made, that he is the Son of God, is something that has been disputed even to this, to this day. I remember I, very distinctly, I've been out, I was out soul winning once and knocked on that guy's door and he just wanted to argue. And one of the things he's arguing, maybe you've heard this too if you've been out, he said that, hey, you know what? Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. He never said that. He never said he was the Son of God. And I'm thinking, how can you read the New Testament and not understand that Jesus Christ plainly said that he is the Son of God? And it's been a, but you know, you go back and it's, it can be kind of difficult to find an exact passage where Jesus said, I am the Son of God. But he went about it in a very, he did make that clear declaration that he is the Son of God. And we see here that the Jews who crucified him, that was why they crucified him. They said, he, he said he's the Son of God. Now, were they lying here? You know, it's coming out of their mouth that, that he said this. But we'll see. That the, that the New Testament plainly declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That you, there, you cannot, I mean, that is the theme of the New Testament, is it not? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you would turn over to Luke chapter 1, and we'll see where the New Testament, specifically the narrator, the Holy Ghost of the New Testament, makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the declaration that God has made to the world today. Genesis chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, and the Lord, 
the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, saw him, she was troubled at this saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And thou, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give, him unto, give unto him that the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jump down to verse 35. And the angel said, answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we see that the New Testament declares plainly that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was the declaration that the angel gave to Mary, that he would be called the Son of God. That is the declaration today. If you would turn over to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, I'll begin reading in verse 66 in Luke 22. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. So we see this is where Jesus is being arrested at the end of his ministry, where he's been taken by the, by the, by the Pharisees and arrested. And they begin to inquire and they begin to interrogate him to, 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 uh, to see what he has to say, that they might find uh, a reason to accuse him and have him put to death. Verse 68, And if also I ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. Now is that a denial of the accusation? Are they saying, Art thou the Son of God? And he says, Ye say that I am. Is that him denying the fact that he is the Son of God? No, that's not. In verse 71, And they said, What need have we any further witness? We ourselves have heard him with his own mouth. So they're saying that's good enough for us. The fact that you wouldn't deny being the Son of God is an affirmation that you have, are claiming to be the Son of God. John chapter 1, verse 32. Of course, the declaration is something that was made by many people. We saw even the unbelieving Jews declared that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, or that he claimed to make that, that declaration. That, he, that was a claim that he made, and that's why they had him crucified because they considered it blasphemy. We see also that it was the declaration that the angel made to Mary. He said, That thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And we see also that it's the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the declaration that John the Baptist made in, in John chapter 1, verse 32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So we see again that that is the declaration that God has made in the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In John chapter 9, we'll see a very clear verse, some great verses, I believe that we could even use out soul winning. These would be good to highlight. If you ever run into that person who wants to make that ignorant and un unlearned uh, argument that Jesus Christ is never claimed to be the Son of God, I believe this is a great passage to turn them to and show them. In John chapter 9, beginning in verse 35, Jesus heard that they cast Him out. And when He had found them, He said unto them, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said unto Him, uh, and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and he it is that talketh with thee. He's saying, Who is the Son of God? Jesus asked him, You know, dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Well, who is he that I might believe? Who is the Son of God? And Jesus said, It's me. It is he that talketh with thee. That is Jesus Christ very, very plainly and very clearly, clearly and distinctly claiming to be the Son of God in the New Testament. It's right there in front of us. 
So we see that all these that it's been something that's been alluded to in the Old Testament and the prophets. We see that this declaration is something that has been made by the angels and even by unbelievers. It's something that's that was declared by John the Baptist and even Jesus Christ himself declared himself to be the Son of God. Now we'll look at a passage here in John chapter 11. Turn over to John chapter 11. We'll see another great passage, I believe, where, where Jesus shows us that He is the Son of God. Where He makes a very indirect claim to being the Son of God. Because we have to remember that Jesus Christ's ministry, He wanted to keep some of the, thi the, the, some of the things about Himself hidden until the time would, would be that He should be revealed. There were certain things that He said, you know, See that thou tellest no man. He, others would, and when the, when the demons would cry out and proclaim Him to be the Son of God and would identify Him, He would tell them to be quiet and to hold their peace. But Jesus often in the, in the Gospels, we'll see, is, is indirectly alluding to the fact that He is the Son of God. It's an indirect declaration. Now the one in John 11 that we just looked at, that's pretty clear. That's not very indirect. He's saying, look, the Son of God is the one who's talking to you. And Jesus was the one doing the talking. That's Jesus Christ declaring to be the Son of God. In John 9, excuse me. But John 11, in verse 1, the Bible reads, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now notice here what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that what, what's happening to Lazarus, what's falling out onto Lazarus, this sickness, being so sick that he's, he's on the point of death, so sick to the point that his sisters are crying out for Jesus and pleading with Christ to, to Jesus to come and to heal their brother. The whole reason this is falling out and happening is as Jesus said there, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. He's saying... This is all happening because when it's all finished, the Son of God is going to be glorified. So it only stands to reason that if we read the rest of the story, all we have to identify is who it is that was glorified, and then we'll know who the Son of God is. Because Jesus is stating here that the Son of God is the one who's going to be glorified. Verse 45, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself came, cometh to the grave. So he's gone to Lazarus. Lazarus has died. And now he's going to the grave, if you're familiar with the story. There was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for it hath been four days. Jesus saith unto her, say not, uh, say, Said not I unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe us, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, because, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when, thou, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith, saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on Him. So who is believed on in the end of the story? Who is it that is, that is glorified in the, end, in the end of the story? It's not Lazarus. The Jews here are not going to Lazarus and praising Him or believing on Lazarus. They're believing on the one who said, loose Him. They're saying, that said, Lazarus, come forth. They're glorifying the one who called Lazarus from the grave. And that is that not what Jesus said would happen? He said that Lazarus would die, that all these things would happen, that the glory of, for the glory of God, the Son of God may be glorified thereby. And who was it that was glorified in the end? It was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made the declaration that He is the Son of God. Now it only stands to reason that if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that would mean that He is God. Because you have to be careful today. A lot of people will say, tell you, They'll say, oh, I believe Jesus was the Son of God, but they won't believe that Jesus is God. The Mormons believe something like that. They believe so, similar to that. They believe that Jesus was, you know, a, a, you know, Satan's brother. They have these weird beliefs about who Jesus was. 
They'll say, well, yeah, he claimed to be the Son of God, but he never, never was God. Well, it would only stand to reason that if Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God. And that's the declaration that has been made to the world. I'll read to you in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made himself per when he had he him excuse me, when he had had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And, he, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and ministers of a flame of fire, but to the Son he saith. So God is saying, about to say something to the Son. We're going to learn here in Hebrews 11 that God said something to the Son, Jesus Christ. And what is it that he said in verse 8? But to the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God is forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The fact that Jesus Christ is God is a declaration that has been clearly made in the New Testament by God Himself. When God said, Thy throne, O God. Because it says there, He said that unto the Son. He called the Son God. And we see here, as we recall our passage there in John chapter 11, that the intent that Jesus Christ uh, would be declared to be the Son of God, there's something behind it. What is the purpose of the declaration? Is it just to declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? There's always a purpose behind a declaration. And we've seen that the, we have seen that the declaration that, that, that has been made in the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the powerful declaration that has gone out. That Jesus is God. That we don't have to sit here and wonder who God is. And what a wonderful truth that is. If we've ever been one that has sought for truth and wanted to know the truth and have looked into all these other religions. I know for myself I spent many years wondering and wandering, seeking for the truth. Looking into all these other ways into heaven. Looking for all these other supposed you know, holy books. Reading books that, 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 that claim to have the truth. And God always seemed like a, a, a mystery. Someone that was you know, you had to kind of grasp for. Someone you were kind of, you know, stretching and reaching to find. But God has made it very clear who He is. He's made it very clear that who, who God is. That God is Jesus Christ. You know, the book, the, the holy book, the Bible, is not something that's, that's hidden from the world. We can find it in every dollar store. It's something that has gone out into all the ends of the earth. It's something that has been declared to the world. Who God is. It's not hidden. It's not secret. It's not some esoteric knowledge that has to be found on some mountaintop that we have to go through some great lengths to find out who God is. God has declared to us today who He is. And He said, I am Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has come and declared Himself to be God. But what's the purpose in that declaration? What is the point of such a declaration? Is it just so that we could know who God is and that's it? That we could just find out who God is and, and take in that declaration and hear it and say, well, now I know that and go on about our lives? No, the purpose of the declaration is that God would be glorified. It's for His glorification. Was that not the point there? And as we read in John chapter 11, when He rose, when he, when, he, when he brought Lazarus out of the grave, when He raised him, did He say that it would be that the Son of God would be glorified? That's the point of the declaration, that God would be glorified which is the purpose that has been declared throughout all of Scripture. I'll read for you, let, turn to Ephesians chapter 3, but I'll read to you from Leviticus chapter 10. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. So God has said, and we could spend the... Uh, Hours going through all the scriptures where God said, I will be glorified. I will be glorified. Glory belongeth unto me. Let God be glorified. 
comes up over and over and over and over again, my friend. That is the point of the declaration. That is the purpose of the declaration that God has made, that He would be glorified. That's why God has declared Himself under the world, that we might be saved and glorify God. You're there in Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 21. Unto Him be, glo be glory in the church by G Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So we see that the purpose of the church, the purpose of the, of, of Jesus Christ is that He would receive glory and He would give glory to the Father. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. That has been the point of the declaration throughout all ages. Throughout all the times that have passed in the Old Testament. Throughout all the times that have come. As it says, they're a world without end. That will be what heaven is about. That will be, you know, we just got through our prophecy conference here in Phoenix and heard and we heard some great sermons about the new, you know, the new heaven and the new earth. And we look, got, to, got a glimpse to, to look forward to those things which are to come. And the point of all those things is that God would be glorified throughout all ages. That is the purpose of the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'll read to you from Revelation chapter 1. But if you would, turn to Revelation 21. Turn to Revelation 21 and we'll see again that the purpose of the declaration is the glorification of God. That God would receive glory throughout all ages. You're turning to Revelation 21. Revelation 1, the Bible says, And He hath made us kings and priests of the God His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You're there in Revelation 21, look at verse 10. And He carried me away in the Spirit unto a, to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto the stone most precious, even a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Jump down to verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of sun, neither of moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. This is the new heaven, the new earth. This is the new Jerusalem descending down and dwelling with man. And we see that the purpose of it is that the nations would, and the kings of the earth would bring their glory and honor unto it. We see that, the, that God's presence is the glory of that city, that it's so glorious that it has no need of light. That is the purpose of the declaration. That is the purpose of the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is that he would receive glory. He didn't just say it for the sake of saying. God doesn't just like to hear Himself speak. There's a point behind it. There's a purpose. It is that He would receive glory throughout all ages. Now, if you're there, if you, I should have told you to bookmark Romans. But in Romans chapter 1, if you get back there quickly, we'll look again at our text. Because we've looked and seen what is that declaration. The declaration is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We've seen that the purpose of the declaration, the point of making such a declaration, is that Jesus Christ would bring glory unto God. That God would be glorified through Him throughout all ages. You know, the, 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 we would, you know going back to, to uh, the Declaration of Independence, there was a point to that declaration, wasn't there? But there also has to be a power. So we have to see, you know, what the declar what is the power of the declaration? The declaration of the resurrection is the power of the gospel. That is the power of the gospel. That declaration that we make is the power of the gospel. The Bible says in Acts 4, 4.33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. So that was the power of that declaration. It's the resurrection. That's the power of the gospel that we preach. It's not that we just go out and preach that Jesus Christ is God, but we preach that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection. But if there was no resurrection, our gospel would have no power. It would simply be, yes, Jesus Christ died, was buried, and He's been there ever since. And that's why that's what sets us apart, the Christianity apart from every other religion on earth. Every Bible-believing Christian 
You know, a lot of people want to make a stink and say, well, you guys think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Amen! That's what Jesus said. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, there is one way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who has come back from the dead. He's the only one who has been resurrected Resurrected, And that is the power of the declaration, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the power of the gospel that we preach, that we declare to the world, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. You know, everybody else, all these other, all these other religious you know, idols and these religious icons, they're still in the grave today. You know, Buddha's bones are still in the ground. Harry Krishna's bones are still in the ground. All these other religious leaders that have claimed to be God, their bones are still in the ground because they're not God. They're false. They're liars. It's not the truth. Jesus Christ is the only one that ever came back from the dead. He's the only one that even made the claim to have risen from the dead. And he's the only one that's been declared to have risen from the dead by God Himself. So we see that the declaration of the resurrection, that is the power of the gospel that we preach. That's why Paul said in Romans 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of, Jesus, of, of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, the gospel is the power of God, as he said there. The death and burial and resurrection. That's the power of God. The resurrection. So that is the power of the declaration. That's the power of it. And Wayne, it's one thing to have an intent. To say, I'm going to declare something. It's one thing that those men, our forefathers, you know, <clears throat> all those hundreds of years ago, decided to sit down and say, hey, let's declare our independence. We've had enough of this of tyranny and oppression. Let's declare our, ourselves independent and free men. Let's start a new nation. It was one thing to sit down and, and write that document up, the Declaration of Independence. It was one thing to say what it is they wanted to do. It was one thing to put themselves out there. But you imagine if the British had come over and they all just said, you know, you're right, and just laid down their arms. What if there had been no fight? What if they had no power behind those words? The declaration would have been pointless. So a declaration without power, you know, makes no sense. There has to be power behind that declaration. So what is the power behind the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? What is it that gives it its power? Why is it that it has uh, meaning and power behind it? It's because of His resurrection. That is the, the power behind the declaration of Jesus Christ. You're there in Romans chapter 1. Look again at verse 3. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. It wasn't that He was just declared to be the Son of God. And, and that's it. No, He was declared with power. There was power behind that declaration. According to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So we see that it is the resurrection that gives the power to the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Without no res with, with no resurrection, there would have been no power to that declaration that Christ was God. There had to be power behind the declaration. And that declaration is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 10, the Bible says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I seen of my Father. See, it wasn't just that Jesus was talking here. He wasn't just saying these words. There was power behind what he said. And that power was that he was able to lay down his life and take it up again. And if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're looking at the power of that declaration. We've seen the purpose of the declaration. Is that Jesus Christ would be declared to be the Son of God. And that God would be glorified by it. The purpose of the declaration is that God would receive glory. Through Jesus Christ. And we've seen that that declaration is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He is God. Now we're looking at the fact that that declaration must have power behind it. And that power is the resurrection. 
You're there in First uh, Corinthians. I'll read you from Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three, verse eight. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but which is a which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowships, the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. See, Paul here is saying that he counted all these other things lost. He counted all these other things that he had attained unto, but dumb. Why? That he might know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why he suffered all these things. He wanted to know that power. And that's what we ought to want to know for ourselves today, the power of that resurrection. And if we're going to go through a difficult time in our life, if it seems like we're having a hard time, that we're going through the struggles of life, we have to understand that we're not the only ones that have done it. And that Jesus Christ Himself has, has suffered for, for our sins. That he, that he endured hardness. That He endured a great contradiction of sinners against Himself. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. Lest we be weary in our minds and faint. That when we're striving against sin, we have to understand we, did not, we have not yet even begun to strive as Jesus Christ did. We have not striven on the blood as Jesus Christ did. And we can know that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what trials and temptations and difficulties we're facing, that we can begin to know the power of the resurrection. When we consider the fact that you know one day our bodies are going to get old and die, we can have that hope and we can have we can have an understanding of the power of the resurrection. And that should give us, give us power to, to, to get through the difficult things in life, the difficult trials and temptations that come our way. You're there in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So again, we see that the resurrection of Christ, Christ being risen from the dead, that's what gives us the point. That's what gives us power. That's, that gives us the, the, our, that's why our preaching is not in vain. That's why our preaching has a point. That's why it matters. That's why our faith is not in vain, because Christ is risen from the dead. Yea, and we are, all, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ. If Christ be not risen from the dead, then we're false witnesses. We're going out and preaching something that isn't true. And we have no power. For, verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. But if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all, are of all men most miserable. You know, if Christ is only going to get us through this life, then we are miserable. We're just like everybody else. We're just like the Buddhist. We're just like the Hindu. We're just like the Muslim. We're just like all these other ones. We have no hope in this world. We're still facing death and uncertainty because if Christ be not risen, we are just as miserable as the rest. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead. And that's what we need to understand this morning, is that we're serving a Savior who is alive today. That there is power behind the gospel that we preach. That we have heard a declaration that has power behind it. And that, that power comes from the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that's what we need to understand this morning, that we, have a, we believe something that has power, that we are not of most men, most men most miserable, that we don't have to go through this life you know, fearing what is to come because we've understood that Jesus Christ is God. We've heard that declaration, and we know that it is true because it has power, and that power is the resurrection. So we see the power of the declaration is His resurrection. That's what gives it, gives it its, its punch, its power. That's why the, our declaration of the gospel has force behind it, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's also our own resurrection. If you go back to, if we refer back to the, the story of Lazarus, we won't turn there. 
But that was the, the power that, that was behind it. The, the power and great... Uh, Jesus Christ was glorified not through His own resurrection, but also the resurrection of, of Lazarus. And we know that we too one day we will be raised up by the power of Christ. That there is a, a, the, there is a, a resurrection coming. You know, that we are not as others which have no hope, but that you know, we have a hope that one day we too will be raised up in Christ. That is the power of the declaration that we preach. 1 Corinthians 15. Go turn there and we'll close here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42. You see, the power of the declaration is the resurrection of Christ. That's what gives its power, as it said there in Romans 1. You know, and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. That's the declaration that God has made, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that declaration is given power by the fact that He is risen from the dead. And it's not only His resurrection that gives us hope, that gives us power, that, but it's also our own. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. You see, we have power this morning through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have power, we have hope. We have a, we have a message, a declaration to declare to the world that is not weak, it's not soft, it's not limp, it's something that is firm and strong and powerful because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's not only our own resurrection, but it's the fact that we can go and tell others that they were, you know, as it says, that they were in bondage all their lives. They were subject to, to fear. By the, by the fear of death, they were subject to bondage. Because they're fearing death. They're not, they don't know what's to come. And we have the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That He was buried and then he was that, that, that he died, that he was buried, and then he rose again. And that if a person will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that they too one day will be raised again in newness of life, that they will be given that glorified body, and that they will be able to, 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 to live throughout all eternity with Jesus Christ and all his saints. That's a powerful declaration that we have. It's like the application would be are we declaring it? Are we, are we just sitting on a, on a stack of dynamite when there's a gold mine out there that we could go out and, 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 and blow up and, and get some treasures? Or are we just sitting on this power, doing nothing with it? Or are we exercising the power that has been given us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's the challenge this morning. You know, the encouragement is the fact that you know, no matter what comes your way in this life, you, know, you have that power. You have that, that hope of that powerful declaration that Jesus Christ is God and He is risen from the dead. But it, remember, the point of that declaration is that God will be glorified. And God is glorified when we go out and we preach His Word and others call upon His name and they will be there to glorify God as well. Are we doing that? Are we declaring the power of the resurrection? Are we declaring the resurrection this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank You for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we, don't, that we do not serve a, a God who is weak. That we do not serve a God who, who has no power. That we serve a God who has power and, and strength. And Lord, that you've risen Christ from the dead. And Lord, that we can rest assured that if we've put our faith and trust in you, that we also one day though our body will grow old and die, that we also will be risen from the dead. What a, what a great hope you've given us in Christ. Lord, I pray you'd help us to, to, to use that power of that declaration to see others say that they also would know the power of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in His name we pray. Amen.